Today we're going to cover how to create flames in Godot. So, the first step is going to be creating a base texture, which I will cover doing in Photoshop, creating the actual shader, which is a beautiful five line solution, using lighting in Godot, creating normal maps using NVIDIA texture tools, using world environments to get a glow effect, creating particles for embers spitting off, and pumping custom textures into this shader. Here's the final effect, let's get started. The base texture is very important because it's effectively a complex data structure that's going to tell our shader how to shape our fire. I'm going to create a circle in Photoshop and fill it with a gradient from white to black going from bottom to top. The areas that are black are the areas we're not going to draw in our shader, and the areas are white are where we've got more intense fire. You can alternatively just go to my GitHub and download the one I've already made for you. Isn't that fab? Once we have our freshly made image in Godot, we can just drag the sprite onto the screen and it will auto-populate a sprite for us. I'm just going to quickly reposition it, and then let's add a shader material and attach a shader to that. The first thing we're going to want to do is export a uniform sampler 2D we're going to call noise. The reason it's called noise is because, you guessed it, we're going to put noise in there. This noise is what we're going to use to give our fire some life and make it move dynamically and have odd, nice, wispy shapes. So now we can go ahead and save our base texture and our noise texture as variables for us to fiddle with. We're going to create a vector 4, call it base, use our texture method and our texture and UV parameters to go ahead and get our base texture of our sprite. And now that's saved for us to play around with later on. We can then do exactly the same process, but instead passing in our noise variable instead of our texture variable to the same function to go ahead and get our noise as a texture. This is very useful because it means we're going to be able to combine these two items to create the fire later on. Now let's make sure our noise is behaving as we expect by setting our colour to be the noise or N. Unfortunately, I've not set up the shader parameter yet, so let's go over to shader params click on our noise and create a noise texture. Within that, we're going to want to set it to be seamless so that we don't get odd tears in our noise and also actually add the noise itself, which is open simplex noise. Now we can slightly tweak our texture. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to make the entire center on the X axis brighter and decrease the brightness at the edges. I'm going to do this by adding a small amount of brightness to my red channel and then I'm gonna subtract the distance from the center. We can find the distance from the center by comparing the distance from the point where our x value is 0.5, so halfway across the texture, to where our current position is, which is the UV. We can then see this effect by setting our color to display our base red channel. And now if we take a look at the result, you can see it looks a lot more like a fire with a much brighter and wider bottom that goes to a tip in the middle. Now let's integrate our noise into our base red channel. I'm going to take a ratio of both the channels and save them in our base.r value. So I'm going to take 30% of base.r and add it to 40% of my noise.r. Coming to these ratios is a fairly organic process and you can pretty much use whatever you want so long as you're consistent in the cherry picking phase after this. I'd recommend for a first time attempt, just copy what I've done and you can fiddle around with those ratios at your leisure. So we can see the noise is combined now, but it's fairly static. We're going to want to make the noise move upward. And we're going to do that by changing the UV value we look up the texture of the noise from. We're going to add our time to our UV.Y so that it reads from a higher and higher point over time. Because our texture is seamless, this is going to loop nicely. Now comes the most important part, which very closely resembles a part of my energy shaders video, which I'm going to link here. So what we're going to do is we're going to cherry pick our colors when they reach certain conditions. If we use the float method, it can turn a Boolean operation into either a zero or a one, depending on whether we got a true or a false back. If we plug base.r is greater than 0.4 into this function, when our red channel is greater than 0.4, we will get a one out, but when it's less than 0.4, we'll get a zero out. If we pass that into our red, green, blue, and alpha channels, it means we can turn the red channel completely on when we reach a threshold. So, if we reach a threshold on the alpha channel, that means whenever we're below that value, we won't display anything, because our alpha will be set to zero, and thus will be transparent. The same principle then applies to the red channel. 
So if we set our red and our alpha to be on when we're above 0.4, when we get up to 0.4, suddenly our shape is going to be visible and it's going to be red and it's going to have these interesting edges because of the noise. We're then going to make our green channel turn on at a slightly higher value so that when we're in a higher core of our fire, we're going to get a yellow area as well. And also if we turn the blue channel on on the final phase, we're going to get our white center. Once we've set all these thresholds, we now have our fire in its true form. An important thing fire does is emit light that your human eyes can see. In order to replicate this... <laughs> no, I'm, I'm keeping that. I'm gonna, I'm... Light is nothing without context. So let's drag in a brick texture so that we can see our fire's impact on the environment. I'm going to make it a bit smaller. And then we're going to want to apply a canvas modulate. What that's going to do is it's going to darken our entire canvas. The problem with the sprites we have at the moment is that they're already lit. So if we make everything dark, we can then reapply our lighting and it will look right. We're going to set our colour of our canvas modulate to a bunch of threes so that it's pretty dark. And then we can add light 2D. We're then going to drag a gradient texture in to be our light source. You can download this online if you search radial gradient, it'll just come up, or you can create one in Photoshop very easily, or whatever tool you like. You can probably do it in PowerPoint if you try it hard enough. And then we're going to set some parameters for that. Those parameters we're going to set are I'm going to increase our texture scale so it's a bit larger, and then I'm going to increase our energy to two. This is going to be important later on. And now we can look at the only other bit of code we're going to look at in this video. We're going to attach a script to our fire sprite. And we're going to use this to control the scale of our light 2D. This is going to make it flicker in a more natural manner rather than being statically on in an area. So what we're going to want to do is we're going to grab the noise we've already put in our shader. We can get that by using the get material function and get shader param noise. This will return a noise texture and from that we can grab our noise and then we can grab a reasonable offset value at certain times. In order to grab this time, we're going to want to keep a track of our current time by adding delta every frame. We're going to multiply that by an amount so that it's a bit quicker, because otherwise delta is such a small number, we're going to very slowly move from point to point. It's worth noting, although this is the same noise as the noise on our shader, because we're only grabbing it in the x-axis, it's not going to look quite the same but it's going to still give us that extra life that's very useful. In fact, if you're ever thinking of using a random number generator, I highly endorse you try to use noise instead, just because the natural translations, rather than jumping from value to value, really add a lot of depth to your worlds. We're going to grab this offset using our getNoise1D function, passing in our time as a parameter, and then we're going to set our scale of our light to be a certain value, I'm going to go with 1.5 as a base, with the offset added on top. Additionally, we're going to divide that offset by 3 because the change in scale is a bit too drastic. And then we get our light growing and decreasing to about 1.8 times its scale and 1.2 times its scale. Continuing with our theme of using textures as complex data structures, we're going to have a little look at normal maps. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but what they do is they contain information about how a texture should respond to lighting information. There are pre-built tools that will let you create a normal map from a texture. I'd highly recommend the NVIDIA Texture Tool, which can be downloaded as a standalone application or as a plugin for Photoshop. I'm going to use it in Photoshop here, where you can save your file as a DDS file, and then it will open the Texture Tool Generator. And as you can see, you get these interesting gradients. What's going on here is different colours represent when light comes in from different angles to the surface. But because it generates it all for us, we're pretty much going to leave the parameters as usual, and then we're going to open up that DDS file and export it as a PNG. Now we have our normal map, we can drag it in on top of our brick texture, and look at that, it responds to lighting from different angles. Isn't that lovely? And as with all the other textures in this demo, you can just go to my GitHub and download them if you don't want to go through any of these gnarly creating normal map steps. Applying Glow in Godot is an elegant and simple process that's all done by using a world environment. What the world environment is going to do is it's going to make any light that gets too bright on our canvas start spreading to its local area. So the way we do this, we add our world environment, we add an environment to that, and we set our background to act on the canvas. That means it will act on our actual screen we're looking at. We can then go down to Glow, 
check enabled, and you'll see already that our light will start spreading to its nearby area and colours will start getting spread around. The reason it does this is because we're going above a colour level of 1 in certain areas because of our light. So normally, if you imagine a colour, if each channel can vary between 0 and 1, where 0 is black and 1 is white. We have the ability to go above 1, and we can apply this manually to items by affecting their modulate. But in our case, the combination of our flame and the light acting on it raises the brightness above 1. The HDR threshold parameter of the glow says when you go above 1, start applying a soft light blend to your colour. So our red, yellow and white is blending around, and because the rest of the environment isn't going above a saturation of 1, it's not glowing. We're now going to want to create the embers spitting out of our fire. So let's create a particle, and let's set its texture to be a mesh texture. I don't know if this is advisable, but it seems to be the easiest way to just create a flat square that you're going to emit as a particle. We'll then add a particle material and scale it up so it's a reasonable size. You can see here that when the particle gets close enough to the light, its brightness goes above one and thus the glow starts to take effect, so our embers will glow as well. I'm going to do a couple of tweaks just to get the appearance I want. I'm going to make there be fewer particles, increase their lifetime, I'm going to make them come out a bit explosively. This is going to group when the particles are emitted, just a fraction. I'm going to slightly randomise the lifetime of each particle, and I'm going to emit them in a sphere. I'm going to set the radius to 100, and now the particles will emit, be emitted in a circle around that central point. We're then going to want to set an initial velocity and a direction. We're going to have the directions y set to minus 1 with a spread of 60, so that in a slight area they'll be fired out upwards, and I'll set the initial velocity to something large. We're then going to want to chuck our gravity up higher, so that the particles will start to fall off over time. You can then tweak these values to your heart's content. I fiddle with the initial velocity and gravity a bit. I end up settling on an initial velocity of 1000 and a gravity of 600. So here you can see the particle is getting fired out, but it's still missing something. We're going to want to set this to yellow, which we can do very easily by setting our blue to be nothing and keeping our red and green full, and then we can actually make our particles brighter so that they glow even when they're out of range of the light. We do this by going over to our raw tab and setting our red and green channels to be two rather than one. This means they'll always be above the one threshold for our soft light glow to happen, and we can just admire our fire hazards flying around. Okay, now I can do some busy work to make things look a bit nicer. I'm going to quickly draw out a stand with a polygon and make it black so it'll light up, and I'll draw a brown floor. I'm going to draw out this environment by using a polygon 2D and using the plus green icon at the top to just click on the screen where I want to draw my image. The actual stand itself isn't quite going to be black, it's going to be very close to black. If it's completely black, lighting won't affect it, which isn't quite what I want. So I'm going to set it to something like 030303. And then the floor, I'm just going to make brown, and that's just going to accept the lighting quite nicely, seeing as it doesn't have a normal map, it's just going to glow naturally. Once that busy work's done, I'm going to duplicate my fire a few times using Ctrl and D. Now I'm going to have three fires that I can position as I see fit. We can do a little bit of fiddling with parameters to see what other kinds of fires we can make. When editing these items, it's very important to make all the resources you're dealing with unique. So the shader material, the shader, the noise, and the open simplex noise all need to be unique, otherwise, as you've duplicated the items, they will share their stats between them, and when you fiddle with one, it'll affect the other three. So we're going to fiddle with these stats, and it's going to affect the way our file looks. The first variation, which is one of my favourites, is a much more cartoony version of the fire, with noise that moves a lot slower and a lot more solidly. This is achieved by increasing the period of the noise, so that will decrease the rate at which the noise changes, increasing the persistence so that we get large lumps of high values and low values that smoothly transition, and whacking the lacunarity down to 0.1. And now that Doom logo you saw at the start. Because of the nature of us having our base texture just reading in values on a red channel, it means you can drag any texture in, and any areas that are black won't be drawn, and areas that are white are more likely to be drawn, focusing on the centre. So we can just drag a Doom logo in, and it will burn right up. Hang on a minute, I've missed something. 
Something looks off, doesn't it? That's right. These lights are all pure white. It looks very clinical, not like a real fire at all. So let's have a look over at the light colour on all of these fires. Swock it over to orange, let's set red to full, make the green channel be half full. Ah, oh, look how warm and cosy that is. And there you have it. How you make funky fires in Godot, tons of ground covered, many, many different parts of the engine I've shown you, and external tools too. Thank you very much for watching been really enjoying making these videos recently. Please do like and subscribe for more content like this, and you can find all of the links in the description.